My first question is, uh, what do you think, why is effective political and civilian control of the military essential to democracy? Yeah. Um, I think the easiest way to look at that is, um, for the U.S. as an example, uh, in the Constitution itself, it sets the guidelines uh, for the relationship between civilian oversight and the military. Okay? The Founding Fathers um, were really suspicious of the military. Uh, if you re uh, may know or if you research, you would find that w when they left England, part of the particular problem was the military seemed to have been the force that they were most concerned about. So when they came to the United States and set up their own uh, country, uh, one of the things that they were very concerned about was the power of the military. Um, so there's a, an essential uh, divide between the two functions, one of oversight, civilian control and oversight, and one of execution. Um, for the U.S., that's in law, it's in theory, it's in Constitution, and some of that was driven by uh, issues that occurred. As an example, around the time of World War, right before World War II, uh, there was the revolt of the admirals. Uh, the Navy was the preeminent force from the beginning of the United States until the middle of the 20th century and uh, they were very concerned that the funding was not going the way they expected it. So the revolt of the admirals, which is a long story, essentially amounted to the admirals trying to uh, coup and take over the government. Not to that extent, but that was the way it was displayed. Um, clearly it didn't work. Uh, clearly, it caused some real changes in the government and the, that relationship between the military and uh, the armed forces. Um, a more uh, European example uh, would be Tur uh, Turkey. Over since Ataturk uh, established the Turkish Republic in the early 1900s, there's been a number of cases where the military has taken back power from the civilian uh, uh, government. And in most cases, it was over funding, over direction, et cetera, et cetera. So there is, there's enough examples in the history of why there has to be a, a separation of the two. Clausewitz, in one of his uh, papers, uh, clearly said, war is too serious a matter to entrust the military men. And I think that in itself is sta stands on its own. Okay, what does it mean institutionally and in substance? Yeah, um, it's an interesting concept because institutionally means that you've got to put the, in place the kinds of controls that um, are effective in governing uh, the military. Part of that is everything from legislation, part of that is from placement of people, part of that is control of the funding, uh, part of that is operational oversight, uh, the typical in investigative oversight of uh, issues that may concern the civilian force. So uh, it starts in the U.S. at least, and in Hungary, by the way, it starts with a national defense strategy, okay? which then is a document issued by the government that lays out not only the purpose of the military, but the oversight of the military. That at least for the U.S., then has a national military strategy where the military gets an opportunity to say, how am I going to do what you, the civilian leadership, has told me to do? And then from there, you have other documents. You've got doctrine, how do the military operate? You have training, how do we educate people to understand the role of the civilians? Um, we have the appointment of civilian leadership, like uh, both 
in Hungary and here your uh, defense leadership is predominantly civilian. Um, uh, ultimately in the United States the leader of the military is the president. But you still have a defense uh, secretary who's a civilian. You've got a defense staff just like you have in Hungary that's supposed to execute the civilian part of that particular relationship. And then you've got the military staff, as you have, that then op uh, does the operational stuff. So in, institutionally, it's all in place. Substance-wise is where it becomes important that you educate uh, the military leadership on what their role is and how they actually execute. It doesn't make any sense to have all the laws and all the strategies and all the documents if the military doesn't follow it. And with that comes um, cause and effect. If, if in fact the military is not abiding, then you have to do something about it. And that that results in removal of individual or change of direction or change of leadership philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a distinct view between those two that uh, one is oversight institutionally putting things in place. The other one is making sure that your military understands what their particular role is and how they are allowed to execute that role. Uh, what do you think of the process of the establishment of political and civilian control of the Hungarian military after the regime change in 989? Yeah, I enjoyed this one. Um, really and truly, if you think about it, if you stand away from the subject and you look at what occurred after 1989, there was a distinction uh, in that the government itself wanted to do something that allowed it to be separated from its old relationships. Okay? It wanted to stand out as being hungry itself and no longer part of a larger organization uh, like the Soviet Union. Uh, pursuing um, a change in the way the government operated and its relationships, I think, were was critical. Uh, was that accepted by all? Not really. I think initially um, there was a there was this desire to distance and to form relationships, but generally there was no real commitment. Uh, it was just a political slogan that that was slowly finding its place over the years. It did so. There was no real commitment. There was apprehension. What are we doing? Are we, in fact, uh, going in a different direction that is not in the best interest of, of the Hungarian people? Um, there was concern about the consequences. What happens when we break the old relationships and formulate new relationships? Are we going to have the same support, power, base, uh, ability to govern that we had under the previous, even though we weren't happy with it? Are we going to have something that's worse, not better? So there was a lot of clear thought. Um, and then uh, you have to remember Hungary's history. Okay? Hungary uh, was dominated over several centuries by others, and so the idea that you're finally out from underneath that cloth and you're able to govern yourself, you, you have to be careful to think about what direction do you take and do you put yourself under another governing activity. Um, that discussion became very, very um, active when the issue of NATO accession uh, became to bubble to the surface. Do we really want to go from the Soviet Union to NATO? Is this in our best interest? Do we really need a military? We're surrounded by by other countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, there was a lot. It was slow. Um, the consensus to go this way. Um, it, was the, it, it was driven by political vision and political goals, but ultimately it succeeded because there was an effort to educate before you instituted. Uh, even before I arrived in 94, um, 
the Hungarian military was already sending officers overseas to, to Western countries to learn about how they particular performed, how they managed, how they executed their responsibilities, how they formulated their, their armed forces. So this was going on well before the 90s. It was already in place uh, in the early part of uh, 1990, 1991. In fact, the U.S. provided a military liaison team in 1992 that was the beginning of uh, a real assistance effort. Other things came later, and we'll talk about it, but it really did. Um, I think ultimately the Hungarian uh, government saw the need to build relationships with the U.S., with the NATO, with the EU, with OC, SC now, it used to be OC something else, um, as being in its, in its best interest. And I think that was the motivator. But it took a while to get started. Once the NATO question came up, then there was some real energy in that, in that regard. Okay. Uh, what was your experience when you first confronted to this issue? In what capacity? Uh, Interesting. Um, the biggest challenge throughout my over 10 years um, was trust and confidence. Um, there's a distinct role that attaches play in a country. Okay? And so there's always that kind of friction between what is the attaches principal role and why is he there and assistance that can be provided from that particular country through, uh, for the military at least, through the attache system. So you had to build a confidence between uh, myself as the attache and, and the folks that I was working with. Remember back in 94, uh, much of your senior leadership in the military had had not been trained in the West. They were primarily trained by the Soviet Union and, and, and were very comfortable in that particular environment. So they had the challenge of trying to understand why it's important to move to, the, to a Western doctrine and they had to get to the point where they were comfortable that, that folks like me, attaches, were actually there to help and not just simply there to collect information for our uh, home country. So that was, that was one of the, the, the real challenges. Now, for me, um, I spent a lot of time with the leadership. In other words, unlike most attaches that showed up for functions, I was constantly out there visiting with the Hungarian leaders. Uh, I would travel with them to visit their units. Um, and that was, in my mind, that was part of how to engage and to uh, build those relationships. So there was very few um, military bases that existed back in the 90s that I didn't personally go visit, especially Tapolza, because I had relatives in Tapolza on my wife's side. Um, uh, obviously, uh, my father was from Yasladain, so obviously I gravitated towards that particular area, Page, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, my father's status in Hungary also made it a lot easier for me as compared to other attaches because he was in the Hungarian military and he was uh, one of the original paratroopers that, uh, when Hungary stood up its airborne corps in 1939. So if you go to the History Museum and you look at the picture of the 18 military people that started the airborne corps, there's a Mihai Suergi in that particular picture, which just happens to be related to me. Um, the other part was, as broken as it was, I actually spoke Hungarian with a limited amount of uh, talent. Uh, 
Uh, I grew up in a Hungarian neighborhood in Lackawanna, New York, and so um, I came to Hungary speaking a an American version of Hungarian with a lot of English words thrown in that were hard to translate uh, for individuals that were never exposed to it. It took almost a year. Um, we, uh, the chief of defense at the time was uh, Chandor Nemeth. And um, we, uh, we were at an Italian uh, reception. And uh, one of the deputy defense secretaries was there as well. And, uh, General Nemeth basically said, you know, to his colleague while I was standing there, he says, you know, this attaché finally speaks a Hungarian I can understand. And so I tell folks, it took me a year to get the Buffaloisms out of my Hungarian. So, but it did work. And I didn't use translators, so personal conversations make life a lot better and help build relationships. Okay. So, yeah, from where I was, it was engagement. How much time can you spend uh, actually out there with the units and so on? And I was lucky enough that I had an ambassador who wanted to do the same thing. Matter of fact, I had two of them, um, both the Blinken uh, and then Tufo, who absolutely loved the military. And so we were constantly out there visiting units. So, that was it, engagement, direct engagement. Thank you. I would like to ask you, what exactly was your job in supporting no. this process? Well, it's interesting. Um, I, as I said, I'm going to give you this paper. Um, in the paper itself, it describes the role of a defense attaché. In fact, it, it's right off of the job description that I, I functioned under. And it also describes the role of uh, a defense advisor. Uh, which was part of the contract that I was under. Um, the primary role, really, if you if you think about it, is to represent the United States. Okay, um, and it's unusual, but it's not different than your attaché here. Okay, um, basically, he represents all of the Hungarian government. Well. The defense attaché in Hungary represents all of the U.S. government, so it's not only the military, it's and it's not only the Secretary of Defense and the Chief of uh, uh, the Joint Staff or the Army Chief, the Navy Chief, the Air Force Chief. You also are responsible to the theater commander in Stuttgart. And now, because of AFRICOM's relationship and CENCOM's relationship, you're also responsible to them. Let alone, you actually work for the ambassador. So there's, there's this this U.S. representation piece uh, that's fairly intense. Um, but then, from a an operational perspective, your role is to work with that country, in this case Hungary, to see what it is that the United States can do to help. And like the MLT that we brought in, or the defense staff, the U.S. defense staff that came in and brought in the planning, programming, budgeting, execution system, or the cubic team that came in and helped redesign the Hungarian military force structure. Um, there's there was over a hundred projects that we did just in the first two years in this same paper i'm going to give you there is a, a long list of or it's not really long it's a it's a summary of some of the uh, particular areas that that the u.s provided support and then as i was showing the good ambassador this is a a briefing that was given by Cubic to a visiting uh, U.S. Uh, delegation, and it also gives you uh, good insight of the programs that, that were being done, and it's partially in Hungarian, so therefore it, it's easily translatable. But the function is really how do you deal with the needs of 
the, in this case, host country Hungary, and what can you do to help? So there was an awful lot of discussion. There was an awful lot of visitations. Um, in in the four years that I was the four and a half years that I was the defense attaché, we had six visits from the U.S. Secretary of Defense, seven visits from the U.S. Chairman of Joint Chief, uh, Chief of Staff. Um, we we won't count two stars and below, but there was not a three-star general in Washington that didn't visit. You had the National Guard leadership in there because they provided, U.S. National Guard, because they provided a lot of the assistance teams that helped educate the Hungarian military. Um, political, uh, the State Department head, uh, uh, and back then it was Perry who came to visit with uh, Minister Kelly at least four times. So there was an awful lot of ex interface between the two countries. And just to put it into perspective, the United States wasn't the only one. You had the same amount of energy out of the United Kingdom, you had the same amount of energy out of Germany um, and several other countries, but those three top countries were constantly engaged. When I was the defense ad advisor, the UK also had a defense advisor operating in the MOD at the same time. So it, again, there was a lot that was done, but it was done by securing teams of experts to come in and provide the level of assistance and solve problems, uh, completely revamp the personnel system, and so on and so forth. Okay. What were the most difficult problems you had to confront? Um, initially, it was commitment. As I said, initially, uh, your biggest uh, challenge was that you had a lot of uh, leaders who had never been exposed to the West, period. Okay. All their education and training came from the Soviet Union. That didn't make them good or bad. That just said they had a different viewpoint, they had a different uh, concept of how the military operated, they had a different way of, uh, of different type of leadership, uh, leadership style, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was how do you get the commitment to move past that to a new theories, new concepts, new um, management style, leadership style. Um, funding on both sides. Okay. Um, as a uh, uh, as a aspired NATO member. There was a lot of funding that was av available uh, from the United States because there was U.S. legislation uh, that provided special money through the State Department and through the Defense Department to support the transition of, of military organizations like Hungary, like Poland, like the Czech Republic. Um, so we were doing okay. Uh, once you became a NATO member, all that went away. So then the challenge became how do you convince the Hungarian government to put dollars against or money against voting against the kinds of requirements. Not to say that the U.S. withdrew all its money, it didn't, but there was a, a change in, in the availability of money and that I think had an issue. Um, so commitment and funding were really the challenges, um, and as I said early on, it was the old guard, you know, it was the old, um, the Bela Beatles who, uh, who clearly had a problem making that mental transition. Um, but uh, for, to give credit to the old guard, those that were in leadership, like uh, General Deak, Janusz Deak, having never ever been to the West and never ever trained in the West, fully understood why and fully pushed hard to get um, his officers trained. 
uh, the United States through its HIMET program, International Military Education Training Program, trained well over 500 officers and non-commissioned officers, well over, including in our war colleges. And uh, between the Army War College and the Air War College, um, four of your uh, chiefs of defense uh, eventually uh, were graduates of those two schools, um, including now your minister, Benker, um, but prior, prior to that he was the Chad and he was a graduate, Fodor, Vague, uh, just a li on and on a list of senior officers that went as majors and lieutenant colonels came home, uh, this term called re-green, which has basically re-established themselves within their own culture and military and used the knowledge they had to move the whole institution forward. And how did you solve this problem? Oh, basically through um, providing as much expertise as we could to solve problems. I mean, we had uh, the cubic application team that did a, a, a whole host of work. I mean, I have two drawers uh, at home of just materials that they produced uh, for the Hungarian military, both in English and Hungarian. Um, they ad addressed almost every problem that was presented to them. Um, SAIC, Science Application International, which is who I was with as a contractor. Um, likewise, uh, the National Guard, uh, the Ohio National Guard specifically, had teams in Hungary at all levels. Uh, everything from how do you maintain your supply system to how do you maintain your hardware and equipment, um, the Air Force had teams in uh, to, uh, to uh, institute new air control uh, as you transitioned away from your Soviet aircraft. Um, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. It was just, um, there was never a week where the U.S. didn't have some kind of assistance team in Hungary providing some kind of help over the course of easily seven, eight years. Okay, I have one more question. Okay. What do you know uh, of the current situation in Hungary? What do you think about it? it it's, a ch it's a challenge caused by lack of funding. Okay, let's be honest. I mean, the, when, I, when I came in 1994, the Hungarian army, not the Air Force, just the army, was over 100,000. Okay. Um, and those 100,000 uh, individuals provided enormous security to the country, um, but there was a cost, okay? Um, your numbers right now are in the teens, and that includes the Army, the Air Force, and what little you have of, you could call it a Navy, but it's more like a Coast Guard. Um, so the challenge is funding. Uh, the government has to um, apply the funding that is necessary. You know, NATO expects you to, to expend 2%. Hungary is barely at the 1% level. Um, and so it, it, it makes it a little difficult. Now, having said that, even with the constraints that you have, the Hungarians are everywhere. With, with OCSE, um, so the Hungarians are participating everywhere where they have a military commitment. So you can't fault them for not participating. It's just the level of participation is, is really driven by the lack of funding and the size of the force. So I mean, uh, eventually uh, the government's going to have to consider uh, applying uh, more resources to make it better, uh, but understand that that's the nature of of the debate. How much uh, funding is necessary to provide a level of security for the country, and I think with time they'll they'll understand that there is a need for slightly more than what they're currently doing. Okay.
Well, thank you very much for this useful You're not going to ask answers. me about the essential elements of civilian control? That was that other email that what's his name sent out. Of course, I want. <laughs> so can you tell me? No, we're me good. About yeah, this no, no, it's I, you can catch it off of here, but essentially, okay. um, there's a requirement for governance, and we talked about that. In other words, you literally have to have institutionalized the kinds of controls that are necessary for the civilian institutions to successfully govern over uh, the military. And that, that becomes mm -hmm. very, very important in the process. Um, I stole the rest of my Accountability is always a key issue, okay? Um, I don't care what government you're looking at, I don't care what country you're looking at, there's always a problem of accountability. Someone all, is always out there uh, violating the ethical uh, uh, constraints that should be placed on them. Um, effective countervailing power. Uh, power. Uh, best example is Turkey. Okay. Um, the Turkish civilian control was meaningless if the military had the power to override the civilian uh, leadership every time it felt like it. So there has to be a, a, a counter force that precludes that from occurring. The, the uh, revolt of the admirals, there had to be the rest of the military that stood up and said, no, we're not going to support this. So that's always... Um, important. And then there's got to be tradition. Okay. The military has to um, ingrain in its own people the, that civilian control is in fact a good thing. And so those really are the four basic principles that, that if you can in, instill that into the process, then generally you're not going to have the kinds of problems that you would otherwise have in that dichotomy between military rule and civilian control.